What's the last thing we talked about, Blake Kroger? Uh, we talked about on May 28, 1966, uh, 3,000. Sean, did I say Sean or did I say Blake? Okay, go ahead, Blake. 350,000 students disease control the administration offices at the University of Chicago. Why did they do that? In protest to the draft. Well, not the draft, but the college's cooperation with the Selective Service. Now, remember what I told you, the Selective Service is that you're responsible, if you're a male, to go sign up for the Selective Service in case it was draft. How many at the, at the uh, financial aid workshop last night caught that? What, Zach, you and I were kind of teasing about it. What did it say you had to do to be able to qualify for financial aid for college? You have to register for the Selective Service. You have to register for the Selective Service. So that's the whole. Somebody asked me, what if you don't? What if you're not 18? Well, you don't have to then. But you'll be, you, most kids are going to be 18 when they go to college. Even if you're a girl? No, that's only for boys. Yeah, girls don't have to do it. But boys, but you, you said only what if you're not 18, isn't that what you said? Yeah. yeah, if you're not 18, you have to do it, but you're going to you're gonna have to when you turn 18 or they won't qualify for the aid. Okay? All right, June. This is kind of interesting. June 13, 1966, the Supreme Court ruled five to four in the case of convicted rapist Ernesto Miranda. On June 13, 1966, the Supreme Court ruled five to four in the case of convicted rapist Ernesto Miranda. Okay. Now this ruling of five to four was in the favor of Miranda. He was a convicted rapist, but he got off because of this Supreme Court ruling. It was a case that went all the way to the Supreme Court. So what did he do? He obviously committed rape, and he was convicted of that. But why did he get off? They didn't read him his, what we call now, Miranda rights. You have the right to remain silent. You have the right to obtain an attorney. If you cannot obtain an attorney, we will appoint one for you. Do you understand these rights? Before the Miranda rights existed as the Miranda rights, you still had to do that when you arrested somebody. Right? Well, because of this case that got the convicted rapist off the hook, this ruling went down now where they call it, when somebody gets in trouble, they read you your Miranda rights. You have the right to remain silent. You have the right to, right to an attorney. Okay? You know those pretty well. Have you ever been arrested? I did get arrested one time in college. <laughs> Long story. Oh well, yeah. it wasn't my fault. Okay, a second thing happened in June of significance. On the 17th, June 17th, in Patterson, New Jersey, that's Patterson with one T, in Patterson, New Jersey, on June 17th, 1966, two men and a woman were fatally shot at the Lafayette Bar and Grill. It's on your ID sheet. On June 17, 1966, in Patterson, New Jersey, two men and a woman were fatally shot at the Lafayette Bar and Grill. <coughs> and you're thinking, what the heck's that got to do with It'll come up later. Did you hear about June? the shooting? Purdue? Purdue, there was a shooting. They found a kid murdered in Riverton today, too. Oh, what? Another one? Yeah. Today? Uh, I don't know if it's a, one high school kid. High school kid. Oh. Moving on. Murder? June 17, 1966. Two men and a woman were fatally shot at the Lafayette Bar and Grill in Patterson, New Jersey. The story will come up later. July. July 19th, 1966. Richard F. Speck, who's on your ID sheet, Richard F. Speck, was identified as the mass murderer of eight student nurses in Chicago. 
On July 19, 1966, Richard F. Speck was finally identified as the mass murderer of eight student nurses in Chicago. He murdered all at the same time, by the way. So on July 19, 1966, Richard F. Speck was identified as the mass murderer of eight student nurses in Chicago. They were in a dormitory where the women worked. How do you think he was identified? By one that lived. Thank you. The one that survived identified him. He got all but one. Can you imagine the fear in that? So he was identified by the only survivor of the brutal assault. And again, it was done in a dormitory where the ladies stayed where they worked. Did you shoot them? Killed them. Was it like a bomb? Or you didn't kill them all. Shot him. Shot him. I, I really don't know if he Just shot like him. Bang, bang, he bang, assaulted bang. him. Was that? At the so University I doubt he shot him. Chicago? What's that? Was that at the University of no. Chicago? No. Oh. Okay, some of this might be familiar for those of you who have made a choice. August 1st. Charles Whitman. an architectural honor student at the University of Texas, Charles Whitman, an architectural honor student at the University of Texas, made his way atop the 28-story clock tower on the campus of UT. August 1st, 1966, Charles Whitman, an architectural honor student, at the University of Texas, made his way to the top of the 28-story clock tower at the University of Texas. Made his way up there. The thing that was kind of concerning is he carried several rifles and handguns and hundreds of rounds of ammunition with him to the top of that clock tower. What's that? Rounds. Oh. Who up? Uh, anybody just ring a bell with anybody? Yeah. Yep, yeah, okay. Keep it, keep it, keep it to yourself now. Mm -hmm. He carried several rifles and handguns and hundreds of rounds of ammunition. On his way up to the 28-story clock tower, he encountered a man and his wife and their small boy. He shot and killed the woman and the boy, and the man managed to escape. So on his way up to the tower, three people were in the wrong place at the wrong time. And Whitman shot the woman and the boy, and the father managed to escape. Once he reached the top of the 28-story clock tower, the 25-year-old ex-Marine opened fire on the campus. Once in a position on the clock tower, the 25-year-old ex-Marine opened fire on the campus. By the time the dust cleared, he had killed 12 people, had wounded 31 others, he had killed 12 people and wounded 31 others. Eventually, he was killed by police 96 minutes after he fired his first shot. So from the tower, Whitman killed 12 people and wounded 31 others before eventually being killed by police 96 minutes after he fired his first shot. Now I want you to think about this. The first thing you'd want to know is what's the matter with him. But before he even got on the campus that day, he had already killed his wife and his mother. Already had killed his wife and mother before he even got to the campus. Why didn't he kill his father? He hated his father with a passion. Why did he not kill his father? So his dad could have to live that's exactly right, Sean. Very good. So his dad would have to suffer the consequences of his actions. The reason he gave for killing his mother and his wife is he didn't want them. 
to suffer the consequences of his actions, but he didn't kill his father because he hated him, and he wanted him to have to live with it. So he killed him out of love? Well, that's kind of what you might say. I don't know. Now, what do you think they did after he was killed? Called his dad? Well, no, I mean, past that, yeah. I mean, what was the next step when they hauled his body out? Took it to where? Cover up. Took it for an autopsy, and what did they find in the autopsy? He had a brain tumor. He had a brain tumor. Now, they closed down that clock tower immediately. How long do you think it took it to reopen? 20 years. 23, 23 years. years. <laughs> Still not open. Well, we'll tell you. Phoenix is a genius over there. Phoenix Winnie Nelson. The Billings Gazette, Billings, Montana, November 13th, 1998. UT will reopen site of sniper shooting. The University of Texas Board of Regents voted unanimously Thursday to reopen the school's landmark clock tower, once the site of one of the nation's worst mass murders. The 231-foot tower closed 23 years ago because suicidal people used its observation deck to jump to their deaths, will be refurbished and a safety barrier added to prevent future suicides. It was from the observation deck 28 stories up that UT student Charles Whitman opened fire on August 1st, 1966. The 25-year-old ex-Marine, beset by personal problems and suffering from a brain tumor, had already killed his wife and mother. In all, he killed 16 people and wounded 31 that day before being shot to death by Lama. The Whitman shooting horrified the country, but the tower was permanently closed until 1975 following several suicides. So they closed it up, but did they close it permanently for that reason? No, they closed it in 75 because people were climbing up there and jumping off. But they opened it again in 98. So very good. So it's that's hilarious. hilarious. Well, here, you know, let's look at that. I was reading that, and I've, I've hit that before. So how many did I tell you he killed? Twelve? Twelve. Now he killed the, the guy and his, or the lady and the child, that's fourteen. And then his mother and his wife. And his mother and his wife is the sixteen. Thank you, because that confuses me oh, when I hear that too. All. Yeah, all of them. Okay, anyway, not positive news. Okay, let's move to September 17th on a more positive note. This is a great one here if you're a baseball fan. On, on September 17th, 1966, Willie Mays of the San Francisco Giant, hit his 535th home run. What day? September 17, 1966, Willie Mays of the San Francisco Giants <coughs> hit his 535th home run. Who wrote on him last semester? Anybody? Okay. Now, the significance of this in 1966 was it moved him into second place among career home run hitters. Moved him into second place. Does anybody know who at that time the career home run hitter was? Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth. With how many? Does anybody know? 714. Okay. Now, who broke his record? Barry Bonds. Barry Bonds, the pathetic loser, <laughs> steroid taking maniac. Wait, so how many did Babe Ruth have? Babe Ruth had 714. <laughs> Who, who, who first broke it, though? You're ahead of the game. You're good. But who first broke Babe Ruth's record? An honorable man. Played for the Atlanta Braves. Henry Aaron. Hank Aaron. Oh, yeah. Very nice man. And I'll tell you some racial issues on that, too. Because the closer he got to breaking the record, because he was black, the more crap he took. Yep. Um, what team was he on? San Francisco Giants. I got to see them play this. The Giants? San Francisco? Mm -hmm. Anyway, that was a positive thing. You don't want to get me into the steroid discussion with these new players because I think they all ought to be banned from baseball. Okay, October is a long story, but a good one. So October of 1966, we're not even going to go into November and December because this, uh, this is something significant that happened. And we'll go back to the comment I made when we first started talking about this and I told you that... On June 17, 1966, two men and a woman were fatally shot at the Lafayette Bar and Grill in Patterson, New Jersey. Well, on October 14, 1966, the Reuben Hurricane Carter story begins to unfold. Has anybody seen the movie The Hurricane? Okay, something to think about. The Reuben Hurricane Carter story begins to unfold. 
Carter was a professional boxer who was the number one contender for the middleweight boxing crown. You have different weight classes in boxing, kind of like you do in wrestling, only there's not as many in boxing as there is wrestling. But he was a professional boxer. He was the number one contender. In other words, that means that there was a world champion, and he was the guy first on the list to get a chance to fight that guy for the title in the middleweight division, and his nickname, boxing nickname, was The Hurricane. Now what happened to Carter, the professional boxer, in late June 1966, Carter and another fellow by the name of John Artis, who's on your ID sheet, were questioned by police concerning those three murders I talked about in Patterson, New Jersey. So in mid-June, late mid to late June 1966, Reuben Carter, the boxer, and a friend of his, sort of, John Artis, were questioned by police concerning the three murders that had occurred earlier in the year in Patterson, New Jersey. Now, the, the relationship between Carter and Artis was not strong. Artis was simply a young black man who gave Carter a ride home early the morning of the murders. Artis had given... Carter ride home, where do you think they were? Bar. They were at Whit Bar. Lafayette. Lafayette Bar and Grill. They were there having a few. Carter needed a ride home. He was kind of a famous boxer, and young, impressionable John Artis said he'd be happy to give him a ride home. And they didn't know each other? Not, not a lot. Not really. Well, on October 14th, a witness by the name of Alfred B. Bello a witness, Alfred B. Bellow, gave New Jersey police a signed statement. On October 14th, a witness by the name of Alfred P. Bellow gave the New Jersey police a signed statement. What's a signed statement? Remember those things I handed out to you during the Kennedy assassination that people had written their affidavit, their statement, yeah. So on October 14th, witness Alfred B. P. Bellow gave New Jersey police a signed statement. What was in the statement? He claimed he saw Reuben Carter and John Artis at the June 17th murder scene. He said he saw him at the scene. So he claimed he saw Reuben Carter and this young John Artis at the murder scene on June 17th when those two men and one woman were killed. The day after he gave this statement about seeing Carter and Artis at the murder scene, Carter and Artis were arrested for the triple murder. They were arrested for the triple murder on October 15, 1966. So they are arrested, charged with the murders. On what day? October 15, 1966. They're arrested for the triple murder. On May 27, 1967, seven months plus later, on May 27, 1967, some seven months later, May 27, 1967, an all-white jury convicts Carter and Artis of the triple murder and they're sentenced to prison for three life terms each. So on May 27, 1967, seven months after they were arrested, an all-white jury convicted both Carter and Artis of the triple murder. Both men were sentenced to prison for three life terms, one for each murder victim. What? What's the life? Uh, I mean, it's it's 100 life. years, the rest of your life. Oh, it's not like. There's only like. So three is just for like. Emphasis? Yeah. Just saying that you're. So you're this bad. They run at the same time. Get them, they run at the same time. I thought if you murder someone. I learned that up after the last project. Yeah. I watched that. Now. That's really funny. And September of 1974. In September of 1974 after spending seven years in prison for a crime he swore he did not commit, Carter's book that he wrote in prison was published. 
In September of 1974, after spending seven years in prison for a crime, he emphatically denied Carter's book, which he had written during the time he spent in prison, was published by Viking Press. September 1974, after spending seven years in prison for a crime he did not commit, Carter's book was published by Viking Press. The name of the book, The Sixteenth Round. Well, here's the deal. Carly missed yesterday on the Ruth Payne deal, right? Mm -hmm. Caitlin, you missed yesterday on the Ruth Payne deal. To make up that 15-point question, your assignment for tonight is to get on the Internet and on, get on eBay. Can you do that? Can you want to do that? Mm -hmm. And find this book and find out what they're asking for. Okay. Very yeah, few in publication. What? Can I do it right now? What? You just have to have it to me by tomorrow morning. Look up the 16th round, and I want you to find a value for it, and print it off, and bring it to me, and that'll be your points for the root thing. thing okay? I have one at home. See what you can get them for. I wouldn't even bring it up here. That tells you what they're worth. Anyway, the same month, the same month in September of 74 that Carter's book was published, Bello, that witness, and a fellow by the name of Arthur Bradley, who ended up being another witness in the trial against Carter and Artis, Bellow and Arthur Bradley state they were pressured by detectives to give false testimony. So on the same month, ironically, of 1974, in which Hurricane Carter's book, 16th Round, comes out, Bello and Arthur Bradley, both witnesses, key witnesses in the trial, state publicly that they were pressured by detectives to give false testimony. They also said, if that wasn't bad enough, that they were offered $10,000 in reward money and promised of lenient treatment in criminal, criminal charges against them for that false testimony. So they were offered a $10,000 reward and more lenient sentences against them because they were criminals if they would give this testimony that was false. So here Carter has spent seven years in jail, maybe for a crime he didn't even commit. Okay? Well, in May of 1975... Carter sent a copy of his book to singer Bob Dylan. In May of 1975, Carter sends a copy of his book, The 16th Round, to singer Bob Dylan. People know who that is, right? He was a... And the reason Carter sent him a book is because he liked Dylan's commitment to the civil rights movement, admired him for it, so he sent him a book. Is Carter black? He is black, yeah. Both are, him and ours both are black. So, in May of 1975, Carter sends a copy of his book to singer Bob Dylan because of Dylan's commitment to the civil rights struggle. Inspired by the book, Dylan writes a song entitled, The Hurricane. And he does that in July of 1975. So when did he send the book? He sent the book in May of 75. In July of 75, Dylan wrote a song entitled, The Hurricane. So he, he writes it in early July, he records it on July 30th, and he performs it for the first time on television on September 10th, 1975. So, he receives the book in May of 1975, he writes a song in early July of 1975 entitled The Hurricane. He records the song on July 30th of 75 and performs it for the first time on television on September 10th, 1975. Now, he's going to sell that, is he not? The single? He's going to release a single and sell it. And where are all the proceeds going to go? To Reuben Hurricane Carter's defense fund because they're preparing to try to get what? A new trial after this evidence came out by these witnesses. So, 
The single of the song, The Hurricane, is released, and Dylan begins a benefit tour with all the proceeds going to his defense fund. If you get on your iTunes accounts after class, you could call it up and listen to it. It's probably on there. Is it good? It's, it's, it's interesting. It's political. Like it? Do you dance to it? It doesn't have a beat. Is it catchy? Yeah. Like, what's known for money still goes to the defense fund. Well, you, you better find out what happens here. What about the other guy? Does it go towards him at all? Not a lot, but we'll talk about that, okay? Don't, your, your good questions don't get ahead of the game. Okay, on March 17, 1976, on March 17, 1976, the conviction goes to the New, Year, New Jersey Supreme Court. They appeal his conviction to the New Jersey Supreme Court. They overturn the conviction and they give him a new trial. On March 17th, Bobby, I'll repeat this a million times. On March 17th, 1976, the New Jersey Supreme Court overturns Carter's conviction and he's given a new trial. Why? Because they said the prosecution withheld evidence favorable to the defense. Okay? Those guys' testimony came out about that they had been forced to give false testimony. So he gets a new trial. And that trial occurs on December 22nd, 1976. So on March 17th of 76, the New Jersey Supreme Court overturns a conviction. He gets a new trial, and that second trial occurs on December 22nd, 1976. The prosecuting attorneys push that the murders were committed for racial revenge because the bar where the murders were committed did not serve blacks. And I'll be darned if it doesn't work because <coughs> Carter is reconvicted, the same life sentences are imposed, and he returns to prison. So a second trial is a failure. The prosecuting attorneys said that he killed these white people for racial revenge because he was mad that the bar did not serve blacks. Well, this is when the story takes kind of a weird turn. In 1979, a special friendship began between Hurricane Carter and a young black teenager by the name of Lesra Martin. How does he make friends? Well, I'm going to tell you the story. You can do it. You can write a book in prison. I mean, that's all you got's time, right? You you can mail things out. I thought they were in the law. Well, you can still, but you are in jail, but you still can do things. Some people study. I know people got their master's degree while being in prison because they've mailed. You know, get your happens. PhD. Now, again, shh. In 1979, a special friendship began between Carter and a young black teenager by the name of Lesra Martin. Here's how this happened. Lesra Martin was 15 years old and essentially illiterate. And he lived in the ghettos of Brooklyn, New York. Never had a chance. Lesra Martin was 15 years old. He was essentially illiterate. And he was trying like crazy to survive in a very violent ghetto in Brooklyn, New York. His parents were wise enough to know he was not in a good situation. Parents were very aware. And so they allowed, as hard as it might be to believe, three Canadian, what I would call free spirits, by the name of Lisa, Sam, and Terry, to take Lesra and educate. They knew he had no chance living with them. They had to live there. That's all they could afford. That was the way it was. And these three Canadian hippies, or free spirits, caught wind of Lesra and asked the parents if they could take him and educate him. And the parents agreed to let him do that. Because they knew he had no chance with them. That takes some real courage on the part of a parent in that situation when you really think about it. 
Okay? One of the first places that Lisa, Sam, and Terry took Lesra was to a book sale. A book sale. And as he was going through the books, Lesra found this book, the 16th round, which took a little bit of his interest, and he paid 25 cents for the book. So the three took him to a book sale. Lesra became interested in a book called The 16th Round, and he paid 25 cents for it. It was the first book that Lesra Martin ever tried to read. First book he ever attempted to read was The 16th Round that he bought at a book sale for a quarter. With the help of the three that were teaching him to read, he got totally consumed by the book. And so what did he do to become friends with Reuben Hurricane Carter? Wrote him a letter. Wrote him a letter. Carter received the letter. He was so touched by the letter, he responded back to Lesra, which led to visits between the two, etc. So the special relationship began with a couple of letters. Now, this is a little weird, but Lisa, Sam, and Terry must have been independently wealthy or they were free spirits. What did they dedicate their life to once this relationship occurred between Lesra and Hurricane Carter? Freeing Carter. Freeing Carter. And they spent many, 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 many hours taking on Carter's legal case. They even moved to New Jersey so they could be closer and study his arrest, trials, and conviction. They moved to New Jersey, brought Lesra, so he could be closer to Hurricane Carter because he was a great influence on Lesra, and so they would be closer to the evidence. With their efforts and some efforts of other people, Carter was given a third trial in November of 1985. He was given a third trial in November of 1985. The judge that would hear this case, his third trial in November of 1985, was Judge H. Lee Sorokin. 1985 in November, he got his third trial. How old has he been? Well, we'll talk. Just, you're, you're good. Keep ahead of it. 1985 of November, he got his third trial, and Judge H. Lee Sorokin would be the judge in New Jersey. On November 7, 1985, November 7, 1985, Judge Sorokin overturns the second trial convictions. He overturns the second trial convictions. What did he base that on? I just want you to listen. You don't have to write it down. On November 7, 1985, Judge Sorokin overturns the second trial convictions, and this is what he ruled. He ruled, after, he ruled to overturn after discovering that the prosecution committed, quote, grave constitutional violations and that the convictions were based on racism rather than reason and concealment rather than disclosure. Now, did the state of New Jersey take this sitting down? They appealed all the way to the United States Supreme Court. So this Carter was freed, but it was appealed all the way to the Supreme Court. all the way to the Supreme Court. On January 11, 1988, on January 11, 1988, the Supreme Court upheld Judge Sorokin's decision. It took 22 years, kids, to free an innocent man. How do you repay a person you sucked 22 years of their life out? On January 11, 1988, the Supreme Court upheld Judge Sorokin's decision, and it took 22 years to free an innocent man. 
the other guy stayed there? No, actually, he got out too. He didn't. He got out based on this evidence as well, but he didn't have all this effort. What happened to Terry, Sam, and Lisa? They returned to Canada, and Reuben Carter joined them there. When he first got back in Toronto, Canada, he worked as the executive director of the Association in Defense of the Wrongly Convicted. Write that down if you want. But he went to work for others that were wrongly convicted. This is kind of a neat story. Don't really write this down, but just listen. In 1993, the World Boxing Council awarded Reuben Hurricane Carter the World Middleweight Championship belt in recognition of his 22-year fight for freedom, an honor that has never been bestowed on any other fighter outside the ring in professional boxing history because he was the number one contender. Did he ever get his shot? Would he get his shot now, 22 years later? Absolutely not. So he held the world championship for a day in honor of his fight for freedom. Whatever happened to Lesra Martin, an illiterate, 15-year-old black boy from the ghetto of Brooklyn. He graduated from high school. He graduated from the University of Toronto. He completed his master's degree, and he's a lawyer in Vancouver. How about that story? A lawyer in Vancouver. Well, that's a great story. If you ever get bored and tell your parents, I don't have anything to do tonight, go rent the movie The Hurricane. Okay? Well, we probably won't. Okay? All right. Tomorrow we'll talk about the Apollo Space Program. Yes. They never did. Hey, now here's what I'm talking Let's talk about these movies a minute. There are some movies I want to show you. There's two in particular, but...